to look up. And today I want to just kind of talk about sticking with it. Just sticking with it. Staying there and remembering to do some things. I think uh, we might... I don't, I, I don't want to be negative today. I'm not scolding, but I do want to have you to think today a lot about sticking with it. And uh, then I'm going to preach from the book of Jude, which is kind of an unusual place. If you want to go there, it's only one chapter long, right at the end of your Bible. It's uh, right before the book of Revelation. So if you know where that is, you should be able to find you. We're going to spend a little bit of time with verses 17 through 23. Jude writes to encourage the church. A lot of uh, people who are being influenced by all kinds of uh, philosophies and speaking uh, interest from all over the place, and, and uh, he encourages them in their walk, and I want to do the same with you today. Adam Ibram, a guy named, his last name is Judson, I can't even pronounce his first name. Adam Ibram Judson went to Burma, and he spent 18 years there in the heat of that place, and he went there for 18 years without any kind of furlough. When we talk about missionaries going someplace, the idea that they're on the field for a couple of years, and then they come home for a week or two or six weeks. And I've heard that I even got to take a sabbatical for a while that was six weeks long, six weeks long and I've got a friend that's talking about taking one that's six months long. But this guy, Mr. Judson, was not able to take a furlough for 18 years. And after six years, he didn't have a single convert, not one. Ernie Faber from here in Iowa spent 50 years in Japan <coughs> and only had a handful of converts in that amount of time. And I appreciate so much his faithfulness and his work in that place, and he said, somebody has to go and take the rocks out of the field. The next guy has opportunity. And I really appreciated that. Mr. Judson endured torture. There was a war that took place. He was put in prison. And he admitted that every time he saw a ship sail away, he wanted to get on board and just go home. His wife's health broke. He put her on a ship and knew that he wouldn't see her for two years. And while they were there over that 18 years, they lost three children. Can you imagine that? And one day he wrote in his diary, if we could find some quiet resting place on earth where we could spend the rest of our days in peace, dot, dot. And then he kind of gathers himself, and this is what he continues with. Life is short. Millions of Burmese are perishing. I am almost the only person on earth who has attained their language to communicate salvation. Da, da, da. By the time he passed away, there were a hundred churches and over 8,000 converts. Most people would have quit. Some people would say that his going to Burma was insanity. But could it be called commitment to the cause of Christ? Could it be called that to the mission we've all been called to? And I wonder about that intentionality. I wonder about that missiology, if you will. I think it's lacking in our world. I think it's lacking in the church as a whole, whether it be in Rising Sun or here or any place else in the world. I think it's really lacking. Most people have trouble even getting to worship, let alone serving the Lord in some way. I think we're a little bit soft. I'm soft. I know I'm soft. I like my hot water I like my sheets. I like... My transportation, we were just talking a minute ago about how pleasant it is to be able to drive to church in an enclosed vehicle with air conditioning and heat. My grandfather did not know that. A horse and an open buggy at best. I think we're soft, we're safe, we're secure, and we fear almost everything. We fear the devil, we fear people, we fear the weather, we fear politics, we fear the world. We just fear, fear, fear all the time. 
We dare not do anything for fear that we might lose some sleep or some cash or maybe our reputation, our status, as we were talking about this morning. I think a lot of times our commitment is lacking, that our knowledge is inadequate, and frequently our faith is just too faltering, far too often. I ran across a couple of paragraphs I want to read it to you. They're really amazing. I want you to think about it a little bit. He writes this, he says, a guy named Goldner, the church is something more than a haven of rest. It's a haven of rest, but it's something more than a haven of rest. Where the indolent, the slow, the inactive, the lazy, the idle and tired may congregate. It is more than a house of refuge to which folks may flee from their pursuers. It is more than a safety zone in the midst of the highways of life into which people may step to avoid the dangers of spiritual injury. It's all those things, but it's more than that. It is more than an old folks home where the spiritually defected, that's me, the infirm, that's me, the incompetent, that's me, may find shelter and be assured against all want for time and eternity. The church is not a spiritual Florida to which people can migrate in order to escape the chilling blast of a cold, unfriendly world. The prevailing tendency in the present day church is to make religion too easy. It is kept within the boundary or the realm of convenience and comfort and rarely is there ever a call to real sacrifice. By means of supper, sales, entertainments, and various ingenious devices, people are tricked into giving, and through alluring programs, efforts are made to surreptitiously, secretly ingest, inject a little bit of religion into the unsuspecting. And when people have come into the church, the greatest care is exercised to spare them so that only a minimum is asked. Do we need to wonder why the church is not more aggressive and victorious? It hesitates to propose a program that summons us to heroic effort, sacrifice, and even the giving of blood. Wow. That makes me think. Shouldn't we be doing more? Shouldn't we be more committed, more faithful to the work and cause? That's what Jude wrote about in his book to the early Christians. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you in the last times, there will be mockers. <laughs> Think so? In the last time, there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. Remember, listen, Church of Christ, remember what the apostles foretold. Remember Scripture. Why? Because it is the words of God. All Scripture is God-breathed. Useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness. If you want to know the way to live, here it is. So that a man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I like to read. I read a lot. Uh, three or four books a month, usually. I enjoy that. And I've got them on my phone so that when I'm driving up here on a Sunday morning or anyplace else, I can listen to them on the radio. I'm on, on my, uh, off of my phone. I love history. I read a lot. <clears throat> Most of what I read, though, is not from God. And I imagine it's pretty much the same with you. Imagine. Even some of the books I read about Scripture aren't Scripture. They might be edifying, they might be informative, they might be even helpful, but they're not a revelation from God. They might be worth listening to, but they're not God's words. 
And you know as well as I do that much of what is written today and what we get in our news in our mailboxes is mostly waste. And in our house, that's where it goes. Most of that stuff generally doesn't add anything of quality to my life. Not really. They just want me to spend money, mostly. Scripture says that scoffers are going to come. And I believe there are many of those around us in almost every medium. It doesn't matter what it is you look at. And I wonder, do I even recognize the scoffer? Do I even recognize the scoffer? Or do I give him credibility because it's just in black and white before me? Or in color if it's my TV set? Why is it that we are unfamiliar with the Word of God? Why is it that we don't memorize it? It's to our benefit, right? Is it because we don't see the benefit? Or maybe because it's too hard? Or because we're just too busy? When I was in college, they wanted us to memorize 11 page, six columns, single space of the chronological life of Christ. I did not do that. It cost me two letter grades when it came to that class. I wish I had done that. It would have been useful to me in my life. I wish I had done that. And I have stuff at home where I can give to you. If you want to, to memorize the New Testament, you can do it in two years. You'll forget 75% of it. But if you do it a second time, they say you'll remember 50% of it. And if you do it a third time, you'll have total recall. Can you imagine? Of the New Testament right here in six years. Well, I've never done that either. Just... Never really wanted to, but I'll tell you what, the memorized word has great impact. And then one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard on a Sunday morning was a guy who got up and all he did was recite the whole book of Romans. Wow! Fantastic stuff. And I want you to see the impact of having something memorized and saying it well. Listen to this young person from Texas. You can do that. Maybe not every word, but the enthusiasm and the communication of a testimony, you can do that. Psalms 119, verse 11. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalms 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. Boy, there's a lot of blessings to be gained by reading. There really are. I would encourage you to read scripture and I would encourage you to meditate on it. You've probably heard that before. But I encourage you to do it again. And if you get a chance, memorize. Uh, my wife likes to do Sudaku. I like to do that stuff. Crossword puzzles and that kind of stuff. And why do we do those things? Because it supposedly keeps us sharp, right? <coughs> How about trying a little bit of memory work and studying the Bible with the same intensity? Remember, remember, to read the scripture. And then in verse 20, pray, pray, pray much. Jude tells his readers, but you do, friends. Build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Most of you have probably heard of uh, Robert Louis Stevenson. You're familiar with his writings. When he was just a little boy, he says, then he remarked to his mom, Mama, you can't do good without praying. 
And uh, she says, how do you know that, Robert? And he says, because I tried. <laughs> Another little boy was sent to his room because he'd done something pretty bad. And a little while later, he walks out of the room and he says to his mom, he says, I've been thinking about what I did and uh, I said a prayer. And his mother said, well, that's fine. If you ask God to make it good, he'll help you. Oh, the little boy said, I didn't ask him to help me be good. I asked him to help you put up with me. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, does it do any good for us to pray? All of us should know the answer to that question. And you and I know as well as anybody that we may not get every prayer answered the way that we expected or the way that we thought best. But God does answer. And what a privilege just to be able to pray. Mark, the first chapter, verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. I don't like getting up in the dark. I kind of like the sun in the window, you know. But while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he did what? There's an example for you. Luke, the sixth chapter, verses 12. One of these days, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray. I kind of enjoy the prairie myself. A little buffalo hollow, the sun just coming up, not a animal, not a fence, nothing but the sun, the sky, and as far as I can see, no people. That's where I feel that I'm really in the sight of God. <laughs> Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night, spent the night praying to God. And let me ask you this. Has there ever, ever been anything important enough that you spent the night in prayer? There was a prisoner, a guy named Ivan Denisovich, he was a Christian and he'd been put into a Soviet prison. And he was praying one night when a fellow prisoner said it was some level of ridicule. Prayers won't help you to get out of here any faster. And Ivan responded, I don't pray to get out of prison. I pray to do the will of God. Most of the time we pray to get out of our circumstances. Prayer helps us, it helps us in life, it helps us to do the will of God. And every time I get in front of an audience, I don't care if it's one or a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand, I've had my opportunity, it doesn't matter whether it's in a foreign country or whether it's here in the U.S., I have a time of prayer, including this one today. It's how I start and finish the day. I hope you do too. Remember, remember what the apostle said and pray. And then thirdly, wait, wait patiently, wait patiently. A few years ago, I took my family on vacation. We went, we've been to all 50 states, and we were trying to catch the northeast corner of the U.S. and the east coast. So we drove over there, went through New York City and Connecticut and up that direction, went to Boston. I had a great time in Boston because I love history. And I, I, I went to the Constitution, the ship, the Constitution. I could crawl through there on my hands and knees and spend weeks. I could be there forever. And my family can't. They can't. You know, they're out there standing on the dock. Come on, come on, come on. Just leave me alone. Just leave me alone. I loved it there. Driving into Boston, though, a few years ago, they were building what is called the tunnel. I don't know if you've ever been there, but they were going to take the interstate that used to go right through the middle of downtown, and they dug a tunnel under downtown and went from going right through the middle of town where the park is, where the highway used to be, and there's a tunnel that goes through there. It took them years. 
all kinds of water problems. It was really awful, massive expense, and it was called the dig. And as we were driving through there, six lanes wide, sitting absolutely still, it took three hours for us to go just a mile or two. We inched forward, and I'll tell you what, I was frustrated, and I was angry, and uh, when we finally came around the corner to enter the tunnel to get through on the construction, there was a huge orange billboard right at the beginning of it that said, if Rome had been built today, we would have used their contractor. <laughs> Have you ever been there? Have you been a place where patience was required to check out at the store, or maybe road construction, or the DOT office when you went to renew your license? Patience is not something that most Americans exhibit very well. We want stuff, we want it now, we want it cheap too. Come on, do it. We have construction on our corner where our house is, and you wouldn't believe what drivers do, red light or not, in that construction zone. Man, just unbelievable stuff. And I said, I look, do I do that? I guess I do, <laughs> on at least occasion, you know? And then I wonder what people say about me. Years ago, my mom said something to me that I thought was really important. She was talking about how she prayed for patience. It is one of the fruits of the Spirit, you know, patience. And she said, I prayed for patience, and God gave me kids. <laughs> Watch out what you pray for. And then when it comes and the rubber beats the road, use it. Do it. We who are in Christ need to exhibit more patience with each other, but we also need to remember who we are and whose we are. The Spirit of Christ is at work within us. His fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Self-control. We need to have patience with each other, but we need to have patience with God sometimes too. And in verse 21, Jude encourages the Christians that he's writing to, to keep yourselves in God's love as you what? Wait. As you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. A lot of people think I'm a pretty calm guy. They say, well, you just calm the water, you do blah, blah, blah. They think I've got it all together, and they're so full of beans. It's not true. I have times of frustration and irritability, irritability for sure. Just ask the people that I live with. And I'll tell you, I'm going through one of those times right now, waiting for some answers. And uh, sometimes when I'm in a hurry, it doesn't appear that God is. And I wonder, does that sound like you? Moments in life where you face the difficulty of something that was extreme or some indecision was influencing your life. You've prayed and then you've waited and you've waited and you've waited. Maybe it was something financial, educational, maybe it was a career choice, or maybe family or marriage or some kind of service. It's just hard, isn't it, to wait on God? And when we think we know what is right and what should be done, it's even more difficult. But sometimes I think we forget that God knows everything and will always do the right thing. And it's a matter of trust. When I was about seven, it was the 4th of July, we took my grandmother who hates water to the lake for a good time. My dad 
as opposed to my grandmother, loves to swim. And my, I do too. My son, he's a fish. Man, he's really good at it. And we went to that lake, and I was just a little kid. And my dad was in water up to the neck at the end of that dock. I was on the end of the dock looking down at him. And I was just going, Daddy. And he goes, come on, come on, come on. Obviously in water, way over my head. I did not know how to swim. I didn't know any of those things. But I knew who was on the other end of that come on invitation. And I jumped in. Trusting him. Do you think God deserves less trust than that loved one? Are you all in? Remember, pray, and wait patiently with trust. And then Jude kind of concludes with his last thought. Demonstrate, demonstrate some mercy. In verse 22, be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy. Mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. The idea of loving the sinner and hating the sin. Have you ever seen the sign that says zero tolerance? You see more of those all the time. Oh my, in Louisiana not very long ago there was a 12 year old who had been diagnosed with ADD, ADHD hyperactivity disorder, and he told some kids in the lunch line that they better not eat all those french fries, because if you do, I'm going to get you. The lunch monitor turned him into the principal, the principal to the police, and he was charged as a terrorist, and he ended up in a juvenile detention center for a couple of weeks. The 13-year-old was in Texas. He was assigned in class to write a scary, if you will, Halloween story. He wrote one that involved shooting students in a school. The police got involved. He was in jail for six days before a court decided no crime had been committed. Matthew 5, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And I'm not talking about excusing bad behavior. I'm not talking about that at all. <clears throat> Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Matthew 9. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, Jesus said, but sinners. Matthew 18. Should you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had on you? <laughs> It's always better for me than it is for somebody else. And then Jude says here again, be merciful to those who doubt. And there's plenty out there who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupt flesh. Who are the doubters? Those who doubt the existence of God or the Lordship of Christ? Those who don't believe in the Lord or have some kind of doubt? Demonstrate, as we talked about this morning, a little bit of mercy to convince them to lead them to the Lord. Occasionally, we will snatch people from the fire. I think I told you, I was doing a funeral service down in Kansas for my cousin's husband's funeral. One of the other husband's husbands <laughs> uh, after the service came up to me and he said, I need what you've got. I have spent the last two years on Wednesday nights two hours per time thereabouts. We have gone through the entire Bible. We have read through it. We have read through many different books. He has a nominal Christian background at best. And he wants me to come to Topeka, Kansas and baptize him. Didn't happen overnight. 
But he just said, I need what you got. And you can demonstrate that for people and direct them in the direction they need to go. If you don't have the answers, find them and go. I have been, I have been saved more than once in a life-threatening situation. I've been pulled from the pool and kept from drowning. I've been kept from falling off of a mountain cliff. I have kept people from touching the wires in an electrical box. Don't touch that. Get out of my way. We need to be able to do the same with our faith. And this text reminds me of the old saying, love the sinner but hate the sin. We should because our purpose is to pull people back from the brink of hell. And as I shared a couple weeks ago, Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. Do you feel that? And the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. And there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Have you kept the faith? Are you keeping it? Are you staying on course? What will it take to do that? Here they are. Remember to read the scripture. To pray. Have patience with God and with people. And a heart of love that demonstrates mercy to all. I encourage you, let's go to Church of Christ. To stick with it. To stick with it. And not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season, what does it say? You will reap. You will reap. Bring in those sheaves. Bring in those sheaves. Come rejoicing with them. Bringing in the sheaves. We're not talking about cheese. We're not talking about oats or wheat.